distinguished guests, friends. I welcome you to this gathering, which inaugurates a series of symposia the Rajiv Gandhi Foundation is organizing through the year of my late husband's 50th birth anniversary. These meetings promise to be a fascinating experiment, the recounting of history by those who were either directly involved or witnesses to its making. Our objective is to create a detailed oral chronicle of this time. Compiling such a record is new to our experience, but we believe it will contribute to an understanding of my late husband's concerns as Prime Minister. Most of those taking part are former political colleagues and associates, advisors or government officials who work closely with him. To make the record comprehensive, we have invited participation from different states and shades of political opinion. The themes around which the discussions have been constructed embrace the full range of Rajiv Gandhi's work, the complexities of nation building with which he dealt, and the issues he confronted, global as well as national. Through these, we believe, will emerge a fuller picture of the statesman he was, the contribution he made to our country, and the legacy he has left us. His leadership of the nation covered a historic phase of transition. We owe it to the future generations of Indians to leave a full and truthful record of this crucial period. Over these past three years, Many of my late husband's colleagues and aides have spoken to me in a personal capacity about their experience of working with him. There were common threads in all these narratives. Each individual spoke of my husband's immersion in the work they share, his grasp of issues and the fertility of his mind. Each one told me how inspired he or she had been by his enthusiasm and sincerity, his unshakable faith and optimism. Even though I knew for myself how passionately he gave himself to his work, what energy he poured into it, the cumulative impact of these statements was deeply moving. Their testimony confirmed both the magnitude of his undertaking and the scale of his effort. What he accomplished in 10 years of public service was to him just a part of his vision and his ambitions for India. But in terms of a human life span, it was a tremendous achievement. I would like to thank all of you who have taken the trouble to join us here today, as well as the participants of the forthcoming symposia, many of whom will take the trouble to travel from different parts of the country. And I'm especially grateful to the President and to the Prime Minister for being with us and giving us the benefit of their insights. I now request the Prime Minister to address us. Thank you. Rashtrapati Ji, Sonia Ji and friends, I thank the Rajiv Gandhi Foundation for inviting me to preside over the inauguration of the first of the series of symposia to commemorate the 50th birth anniversary of Sri Rajiv Gandhi. The Rajiv Gandhi Foundation has diversified into a wide range of philanthropic activities in a short period since its inception. It has established itself as one of the premier institutions promoting academic exchanges on issues of national and global concern and encouraging excellence in intellectual pursuits. It has also made a mark in conducting development programs for the underprivileged. I cannot think of a more appropriate homage to the memory of this great son of India who died three years before we could celebrate his 50th birth anniversary. The topic selected for the inaugural symposium ethnicity, pluralism, and conflict resolution in nation building 
is not country specific, but it has a distinct applicability to democracies, especially new democracies, and I am certain it has been phrased keeping India and the secular and democratic ideals of Rajiv Gandhi in mind. Conflicts are sought to be resolved rather than suppressed. Fascism promotes the supremacy of one category of people, ideology, or cultural trait. Of course, while ethnicity and pluralism are related, I do not believe that conflict necessarily arises from them or from them only. Hence, I shall treat them sequentially without attributing any causal inevitability to the sequence. Ethnicity relates to social groups which form part of a larger population but may be distinguished by common ties of race, language, religion or culture. Ethnic identities may have primordial roots, though in many cases these may have been subsumed under more modern identities. Ethnic diversity within states is a fact of the contemporary world. The modern state aims at ensuring political unity by forming an appropriate framework which gives suitable avenues of expression and development to all composite groups. As the world comes closer, ethnicity is bound to grow in incidence and variety. Ethnicity is a very complex <coughs> phenomenon. Like all other social phenomena, it changes with time and place. Politically, it embodies both positive and negative features. On the positive side, it acts as a social bond which helps an individual appreciate his roots in a community. It provides emotional support which is particularly important in urban mass societies. On the negative side is the connotation in which the self-identity is perceived and defined in terms of what distinguishes one community from another. This negative self-definition is a feature of some communities and newly formed countries that are unable to find any other mooring and tend to exaggerate their differences from others in often, often in hostile terms. Pluralism in our context today would largely be social pluralism, but it could also consist of other dimensions such as those pertaining to theologies and legal issues. These dimensions often coexist with social pluralism and make the phenomenon even more complex. Social pluralism recognizes the multiplicity of associations in communities in all their colorful manifestations and the nation denotes a harmonious whole. The traditional definitions of nationhood tended to highlight one or another social characteristic as an essential anchor to hold the nation together. This characteristic would then be emphasized and imposed on others. In this arrangement, a deliberate inequality was enforced and justified. This interpretation of nationhood has fortunately now given way to a more realistic recognition of egalitarian pluralism in democracy. A rich associational life is essential to democracy. Associations serve to educate citizens in political life, strengthen their relations with the state, and help to ensure that no single interest becomes dominant. Their right to exist flows from the fundamental rights of individuals. Their interplay provides information, discussion, negotiation, and compromise, which are all essential stages of decision-making in democracy and help public decisions to be more rational and acceptable than they would otherwise be. Conflict is an unavoidable facet of human life. It is as much an internal process of the human mind when it evaluates the pros and cons of a decision as it is a part of the individual's daily interaction with others in society. 
Some philosophers have attributed all progress to the continuous process of conflict and conflict resolution. The absence of conflict may be an impossible condition to reach and it may often mean brutal repression or callous indifference by one section vis-a-vis the rest. The maturity of a society is thus measured not so much by the absence of conflict in it as the stability of its institutions and procedures for resolving them. The more broad-based and impartial this mechanism, the less is the likelihood of discontent and disaffection festering in it. The state with its organized judiciary is the final arbiter of all conflicts, but there always exist traditional means of settling matters at the level of the family and the community, and most issues do get resolved at these levels. In fact, the most important level at which most of the conflicts are resolved in India is the village. It is there that most of the conflicts somehow get resolved, whether before it goes to the courts or after it makes all the rounds of the courts, ultimately it is decided under a tree in the village. This has been our experience for a long time. Conflicts arise when groups perceive themselves as being the subject of discrimination with reference to another group. The demands may relate to control over resources, territory, demand for self-governing rights, or even cultural rights. The issue may not be one of lack of development, but relative underdevelopment in comparison to another ethnic group. This self-perceived and often justified notion of second-class treatment provides a base for political mobilization within the ethnic groups and could assume dangerous proportions when this mobilization becomes exclusivist and precludes any compromise. Leaders emerge who may have something genuine sometimes and sometimes cynical and personal or even pecuniary motive in the strengthening the ethnic identity which may at times turn out to be at the expense of the broader identity of the composite state. Undemocratic forms of government seek to justify themselves by creating myths of the superiority of one elite group of people over all others. The existence of pluralistic democracies, however, is a constant challenge to the other's exclusivist ideology, but the latter often <coughs> instigates trouble and this is what is happening in many countries. In the former, by taking advantage of their liberal and free atmosphere. Liberal democracies have always had to face up to this threat or face the risk of succumbing to fascism. This task is never easy because it is always possible to provoke a small faction to violence and try to give it the garb of a popular movement, particularly so when a plural society is undergoing transformation such as economic development. It creates a gap between achievement and expectations. Change leads to a narrowing of the social space. Old social structures and safety, safety nets fall apart. New social differentials emerge. All these accentuate discontent and sometimes lead to a backlash in its negative form. Issues concerning ethnicity and pluralism have gathered considerable importance in international affairs in recent years, especially after the Cold War, which has led to new nations and fragmentation of existing nations. There continues to be a consistent effort to look closely at the problems of minorities constituting the larger mosaic of pluralistic states. Such scrutiny has come largely from many professing to belong to unitary nation states, though in fact there are few such, howsoever the term may be defined. India has demonstrated in practice for millennia the philosophy of unity in diversity long before we became a nation state. And the modern state of India 
which is multi-ethnic, multicultural, multilingual, and multi-religious, continues to be living proof of the dynamism and the vibrancy which can be imparted to a society with different stands. Experience of such large multi-ethnic states has shown that democracy is one of the most potent instruments for containing and moderating ethnic conflict. In this regard, India stands as one of the best examples of conflict resolution through the democratic process. Pluralism, federalism, and the developmental process with emphasis on economic and social upliftment of the underprivileged sections of society have resulted in diverse groups acquiring a stake in the process of nation building as a whole. Therefore, within the context of democracy and development, ethnic groups residing in various parts of India have become the building blocks, not the roadblocks, to the development of the Indian nation. This is one of the most important achievements of the Indian constitution, which has provided the legal framework for nation building. There are setbacks, there are false steps on the way, but the direction is set and the goal is clear. We have been extremely fortunate in India in our rich and diverse heritage, which has contributed immeasurably to producing a vibrant culture and nation. We must recognize the importance of sustaining in every way the processes of democratic dialogue to enhance the quality of our society. At the same time, we have to be alert to the dangers which afflict multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multilingual, pluralistic states, aside from a lack of understanding and the dynamics of such states among some people. We have the recent increasing phenomenon of terrorism by which a microscopic few wish to impose their fiat on the name in the name of larger majorities, often with cynical external assistance. The challenges and opportunities which face such nations have been described in the Moscow Declaration signed in June this year. Ultimately, however, what would matter is the will of the state and its determination to retain democratic norms which alone safeguard the future for composite states. The stability of pluralistic states is a valuable contribution to the security of the world and to the task of international cooperation. With the recent experience behind us of the horrible consequences of unbridled ethnicity, thinking people around the world are awakening to the fact that while it is the duty of the state to ensure that fair treatment is given to all its composite elements, there should be no moral support to processes of disintegration based on specious distinctions between peoples and nations. It is notable that the UN Declaration of 1992 on the rights of persons belonging to national or ethnic, religious or linguistic minorities does not condone activities which run contrary to the territorial integrity and political independence of states. Africa, a victim of arbitrary colonialism, has demonstrated its understanding in the OAU Declaration of 1993 on the mechanism for conflict prevention management and resolution. The recent Managua declaration, while severely condemning all terrorist acts, expresses the utmost respect for the sovereignty, independence, territorial integrity, and inviolability of borders, and compliance with international treaties as indispensable for the development of democracy. Democracy is in fact the key essential in conflict resolution and nation building, particularly in pluralistic states. It is only within a democratic framework that the aspirations of all constituent elements can be fulfilled. It is only through mutual understanding, mutual respect, and the processes of dialogue that genuine grievances can be removed and the miasma of misperceptions dissipated. Conflicts and differences cannot be removed by government decrees alone, nor can the energy of diverse elements channelized towards nation building except through the means and methods available within a democratic framework. Sri Rajiv Gandhi well understood this complex interplay between ethnicity, pluralism, and nation building. 
we had many long discussions, particularly when we were thrashing out the new policy, education policy in 1985 and 86. I remember the long hours which he devoted for one policy among so many which he had embraced, and the way in which he analyzed the subject of ethnicity, the subject of secularism in India was something which I will never forget. It was it was very much out of the out of the ordinary, and that is what really makes his vision of India something qualitatively different. He realized that a delicate balance has to be maintained between diversity and disintegration, control and freedom, and unity and uniformity. I am sure these symposia being organized by the Rajiv Gandhi Foundation will be able to go into these issues in greater depth than I have been able to do today and offer useful suggestions to countries which believe in democracy, development, and freedom. Thank you very much. Honorable Prime Minister, Sinhasen Rauti, Chairperson of Rajiv Gandhi Foundation, Srimati Sonia Gandhi, Honorable Speaker, Shishwira Ji Patri, other members, members of the Union Council of Ministers, Governor of Uttar Pradesh, Chief Minister Haryana, Honorable Members of Parliament, Excellencies, Participants, Ladies and Gentlemen. Rajiv Gandhi would have been 50 years old today. Fate will that he was not to be a master. But his memory has brought us together to honor his achievement and renew his memory. The symposia organized by the Rajiv Gandhi Foundation on this anniversary is an appropriate <coughs> recognition of a great man who achieved so much in such a short time. I'm honored to inaugurate it and to pay my personal tribute to Rajiv Ji. Rajiv Gandhi symbolized the optimism and vitality of the post-independence generation in this country. He had a vision of what this nation should become and a determination to turn that vision into reality. In his own words, I am young and I too have a dream. I dream of an India, a strong, independent, Self-reliant and in the first and the front rank of the nations of the world in the service of mankind. A man of remarkable courage, fortitude, and strength of conviction, his life was a tale of a leader who put his country's interest above his own. Rajivji took over the reins of power at a very critical moment in our history. I can still recall vividly the poise and dignity with which he faced Indira's assassination, conscious that his personal dream must give way to the responsibility of serving the nation and providing its leadership. His very first broadcast to the nation as Prime Minister forged a bond of trust with the people. The nation, he said, has placed a great responsibility on me 
the ought in me to have the job. I shall be able to fulfill it only with your support and cooperation. I shall value your guidance in opposing the unity, integrity, and honor of the country. Rajiv Gandhi's role to the challenge of consolidating national unity, making the promotion of secularism was among the foremost priorities of his government. In words so reminiscent of Pandigi, he declared, in words answering communism with communalism will only help subversive and effective <coughs> forces. The combined might of the people and the government will sort the design. There's only one India that belongs to all of us. Unquote. The manifest sincerity with which he initiated serious negotiations to tackle the seemingly intractable problem in Punjab. Assam and Mizoram yielded dividends. We take this for granted today, but <coughs> let us acknowledge that the restoration of stability and democracy in these states is in no small measure due to Rajiv's patience and perseverance, deeply rooted in the democratic ethos. Rajiv Gandhi firmly believed that violence and terrorism had no place in our society. Or for the matter of fact, in the world. India, his India, was a mosaic of languages, cultures, and ethnicities, not simply tolerating each other, but accepting and harmonizing all the diversity as part of the composite whole. He, therefore, vigorously resisted the onslaught of communal forces on our secular fabric. Secularism, he said, is the basis of our unity, and any force that is out to counter secularism any communal force, any religious force, any political force that relies on communalism or on religious interests must not be allowed to use this interest to weaken the nation. Communism is a danger that is, to come, that is common to all in India. Our strength will lie not in allowing this to flourish, But in seeing yes, that everyone's interest is fulfilled by reducing communism. The massive mandate secured by Rajiv Gandhi in 1984 election heralded a new era in the nation's development. For Rajiv saw clearly that the eradication of poverty was only possible through technological modernization, higher productivity, and economic expansion. He was cognizant of the need to integrate India with the global economy, to attract and absorb advanced technologies in the quest for national reconstruction. He therefore <coughs> initiated the economic reform and liberalization process to prepare the nation for the challenge <laughs> of global competition. His restructuring of trade, fiscal, and industrial policies reflected this decisive drive towards modernization. Rajiji gave great encouragement to the private sector, rightly believed that it had reached a stage of maturity. 
wherein it could shoulder greater responsibilities. Their involvement in key sectors of the national economy, like oil exploration, chemicals and defense production, affirm the partnership between the nation and its entrepreneurs for the good of the people. In truth, Rajiv Ji's approach to economic questions was in consonance with the reality of the time. His imaginative and innovative approach towards the development of India was based on the confidence that science and technology should be taken to the masses, as this was the only key to poverty eradication and to better the standard of living of the masses. It was under the, his direction that target-oriented technology missions in the field of tech, telecommunication, oil seeds, immunization, drinking water, and electricity were established. Science and technology had been given relevance <coughs> to the lives of millions of people. In the area of space, atomic energy, electronics, oceanology, and biotechnology, Rajiv Gandhi took personal interest in strengthening the national scientific base. 